Hmm. Praise the Lord. Till I am a soul on fire. Any souls on fire? Soul on fire. Wow. Let's see if this stays in my ear. Galatians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. That's where we're at. These Galatians. These Galatians. It's where modern Turkey is today. Um, when Paul went up there to preach the gospel and to clarify the doctrine of Christ, uh, they were open, excited, and willing. And, and it's amazing how today the, the area of the Galatians in modern time today is pretty much void of the gospel and Christ. God has a remnant, but the remnant is uh, really seriously not welcomed by their neighbors. It's a difficult place to be as a Christian today, uh, even more so in our turbulent times. But Paul went up there and preached the gospel, taught them the doctrines of Christ, the Savior, the, the Messiah, and they were really excited about it. Now, the Jewish community at the time uh, was somewhat open to hearing Paul, but uh, it, it was short-lived. There was almost a riot and a rebellion, and they pretty much ran Paul out of town. And um, so... Paul never lost his burden for the people, his, his love for the people, his compassion, his, his burden for their souls. Some of you have relatives or friends that you know, and you have a burden for their souls. And it, it's been, for some of you, it's been years and years and years. Isn't it true that you haven't lost that burden for them? You haven't lost it. They're still in the forefront of your heart and on your mind. You want to get your phone before we continue? I'll let you get your phone if you need to. Okay, we're all good now? Now, what was I even teaching? Those distractions, it just blows me away. Oh, yeah, we were talking about Genesis. So in the book of Genesis... Um, Was it Second, second Timothy? Yes. And te Those phones really throw me off. I have no idea where I'm at now. Oh, wow. What am I going to do? I don't know what to do now that the phone rang. Um, I'm glad that uh, you really feel bad that your phone rang now. <clears throat> do we still have that video that goes up there that says you can now turn your phones off? Do we still do that? Because it might be their fault. They didn't throw that up there today. And it's their fault that your phone rang. You're starting that now? That's awesome. Let me see. Yeah. There you go, folks. I will give you a few minutes to turn your phone off. Okay, we all got that? Because if it rings again, I'm going to have to call the authorities. And that's going to be not a good situation. They're very brutal. All right. So back to our friend and blessed apostle Paul who wrote this wonderful letter to the Galatians because of his burden, his pain, his sorrow for the souls of those people. Uh, again, I, I bring it back home to you. I mean, the people that you love, your, your family, your friends, your neighbors, maybe your co-workers, those who you burden for, their souls. And how no matter how much time goes by, whether it's a year, two years, or 50 years, your burden's still there. The pain is still there. You want them not to miss out on the, on the, on the hope that you have, on, the, on the, the, the gift that you have, the salvation you have. 
So in, in some ways you can reflect or you can understand Paul's heart here. So it says in verse 10, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored in vain. You observe days, months, seasons, and years. What is Paul talking about? Their traditions. He's, he's talking about them keeping all their traditional or their religious feasts and festivals and practices. You observe days and months and seasons and years. He says, I'm afraid for you. Lest I've labored in vain. What was his labor? He teaching them, sitting with them, having Bible study after Bible study, bringing the scriptures to them, opening the scriptures to them. And he did. He did that. The problem with Paul's burden is that, for us, example, for if we observe... Uh, the, the seasons, the months, the days, and the years, if we observe that so as to gain approval from God, then we have the same problem the Galatians had. Um, there is nothing you can do to please God. Now, for some of you, you're like, what? No, there's nothing you can do to please God. The only thing that pleases God is what Jesus does through you. It's the work of Christ that pleases God. It's, it's his son that pleases God. And how does, the, how does Jesus do the work through you? It's called the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus went off to be with the Father and sit at the right hand of the Father in all the glory that he deserved and he said, I'm sending you, I'm leaving, but I'm sending you a helper. A helper. And, and it's, everything's going to be okay. Because the helper is my spirit. I'm going to place God inside of you. Now remember, it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Right? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I'm going to send the person of the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And the person of the Holy Spirit is going to teach you, guide you, grow you, and use you. That's what the Spirit's going to do. He's going to teach you, guide you, grow you, and he's going to use you. And what is he going to do all those things for? His glory. Colossians says that all things we created by Jesus... And all things were created for Jesus. You were created for Jesus. You were created, designed, and put together so that Christ could live inside of you and continue the work he started. He wants to do the work still. He wants to still reach the people, grow the kingdom, and he, wants, he needs your body. And so all the work that Christ does in and through you is what God is pleased with. That's what God's pleased with. It, it says that there's nothing you can do. It's not by works. And it says it's not by works because if it was, you'd have something to boast about, right? Now, if I did the work, I could say, hey, look what I did. I like that song, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. You ever hear that song? Yeah. Look what the Lord has done. Christ, on, on our brochures, on our bulletins, on our sign, every piece of literature that Club Zion has, it says what? It's all about Jesus. If, if Club Zion ever becomes it's all about Pastor Keith, then run away. Don't come here. Find another church. Because it, it can't be about you or me. It has to be about Jesus. And he says, you observe days and months and seasons and years because the, the, the legalistic Pharisee 
Pharisaic uh, Judaizers have cheated you into believing that you can please God with your keeping religious ceremonies. Um, we, we serve communion on the first Sunday of the month. Every first Sunday of the month, we serve communion. Do we serve communion just to please God? Please say no. We don't serve communion to please God. We serve communion because God told us to serve communion. God said that we are to do this in remembrance of him. So when we have communion on the first Sunday of the month, it's all about Jesus. So to keep the ordinances is not necessarily a bad thing as long as it expresses the grace of God in the things we're doing. So if somebody is keeping the, the ordinances, how do we know if they're doing it for the grace of God how do we know if they're doing it uh, in the expression of the grace of God, in, in, the, in the acknowledgement of the grace of God in their life, or they're doing it to seek favor for God? How do we, how do we know that? We don't. We don't. But the danger in promoting that type of practice does create the ability to judge. That's what it does. God has set us free from the law. That is a theological fact. He has set us free from the law. Why did Jesus set us free from the law? Because Jesus fulfilled the law. Tell me I'm wrong. No, I'm not wrong. The scriptures are very clear. Jesus fulfilled the law. So if Jesus fulfilled the law, then what business do I have trying to finish what he already completed? Does that make sense? What business do I have finishing or continuing a work that's already done? Let's say that you painted a painting, a beautiful painting, and it was just magnificent. It, it was like a sunrise and the beams of... The colors, just like the water glistening and dolphins coming out of the water and palm trees, tree, trees flowing on the beach. And it was just like, wow, this beautiful painting. And you finished it and you signed it, right? How offensive would it be to have people coming with their paintbrushes and colors and adding to your painting? Would it be offensive? It'd be very offensive, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you kind of beat them up? You know? I would. I'd beat them up. Um, just kidding. But Jesus completed the painting. What was the painting he completed? Salvation. The salvation of our souls was the most beautiful painting ever, ever painted. And then we come along with our ordinances. We come along with our 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 feasts, our days, our seasons, and we want to fix the painting or complete it. And that's the problem that Paul was having with them. And he says, I'm afraid for you. Why? Why is he afraid for you? Because Jesus doesn't work like that. He says, the painting is done and it's perfect. Leave it alone. Now get on that beach and enjoy the sunrise. That's what Jesus is doing. It's perfect. Leave it alone. Now get on the beach and enjoy yourself. Give me the glory. Tell everybody how beautiful the painting is. That's it. It's pretty simple. But the Judaizers were robbing the Galatians, robbing them. Um, so what happens if we begin to observe 
the ordinances, religious ordinances, uh, what, ha what is the risk we run if we begin to teach and begin to encourage the congregation to get involved in doing religious works? What is the danger? I'll tell you what the danger is. The danger is you begin to develop a congregation that begins to be criticizing, comp uh, uh, comparing, and um, condemning, judging. Why? When you teach the congregation that it's all about keeping religious organ ordinances, making sure you do the right thing, don't do the wrong thing, stay in line, make sure you practice all the feasts and all the festivals and everything, the years and the dates and seasons and everything, make sure you do everything right. What happens is you begin to have these legalists. You know what a legalist is? A legalist is somebody that makes sure that everybody knows that they're better than them. And the way that he makes sure that everyone knows that they're, he's better than them is he preaches legalism of which they can't keep but pretends that he is keeping it and therefore bringing on the facade that he is more holy and more religious than they are. And so the legalist comes along and he preaches this doctrine because he's much better than everyone else and he's much more holier than everyone else and he has to remind them every day of how unholy they are by preaching the law to them of which they know they can't keep so then the legalists in the congregation rise up and they begin to criticize those who can't keep the law. They begin to compare one with another to see that one's more spiritual than that one and that one's not as spiritual as the other one. And then they begin to condemn one another. And before you know it, they begin to excommunicate members of the church because they don't measure up. And that was the danger that was involved with the Galatian churches. Um, in verse 12, he says, Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me. I encourage you, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. Now, when Paul came to the Galatians, what kind of person was Paul? Highly educated. He knew the doctrine. He knew the Old Testament inside and out. He knew the New Testament by the teachings of Jesus Christ himself. He was a scholar, a theologian. He was a genius when it came to theology. And when he says, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you, what did he, he do. He came to them not lording over them, not being better than them. He came to them and spoke simple language that they could understand. He met them where they were at. And for some reason, some of the Galatians were rising themselves above the others. And he's saying, that's not how I came to you. I have not injured, you have not injured me. He's basically what he's trying to say is, we're in this together. We're in this together and I have not stopped loving you. We're in this together and I have not stopped loving you. Now, up until this chapter, Paul's been pretty hard on them. He's been just like hammering them, hammering them. And then he gets to chapter 4, and now he starts loving them. He starts sharing his burden with them. And he begins to share in chapter 4 his pain that they've caused him because of his great love for them. The problem with the Galatians, they were, they were dropping out of school, and well, they were enrolling in kindergarten. That's what they were doing, dropping out of school and enrolling in kindergarten. How many of you know how to spell kindergarten? 
Do you know that? I always, I always thought I knew how to spell kindergarten. I always did. And as I'm preparing this lesson and I'm, and I'm, I'm writing out my notes, I get to kindergarten and I write it out. And s- s- what's the uh, Google? Google says, you're wrong, Keith. <laughs> what do you mean I'm wrong? You're wrong. It's not, it's not D-E-N, it's T-E-N. I didn't know that. I thought it was kindergarten. And I don't know where they got the garten from. It's German? Genius. Yeah. Well, see, that's my ability to come down. <laughs> kindergarten. Um, I should have went to kindergarten. Yeah. You know, they... They let me move on to fourth grade because I started growing a beard. (laughs) And it needs to be in me. All right, Galatians chapter 4, verse 13. You know that because of physical infirmities, I preached the gospel to you at the first. This is interesting that Paul brings this up in chapter 4. And he brings this up several times in his writings, but not too often. But here he says... You know that because of in my physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. What do you mean physical infirmity? Physical infirmity. I've heard a lot of preachers say that if you're a Christian, you shouldn't be sick. That Christians don't get sick. We need to rebuke that because Christians don't get sick. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if Paul's lying or they're lying. Which do you think it is? Do you think they're lying or do you think Paul's lying? Hmm. I wonder what, if they think they're lying or do they think Paul's lying. Because Paul is pretty clear that he had an infirmity. He even said that it was a hindrance. I, I recall somewhere in a book I read that Paul prayed three times for that infirmity to be removed. It was some book. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was a Bible. Three times, Lord, if it is your will, please take this infirmity away from me. And the Lord said, no. No. He said, no, I'm going to use that to keep you humble. I'm going to use that to bring glory to myself. But why do preachers tell their congregation that that they shouldn't be sick because they're Christians? I'll tell you why they tell their congregations that. So that they're better than them. It's a form of legalism. Because the preacher that's preaching that has to have the facade that they're not sick. But you are. And then you have to hide your sickness because the rest of the congregation will think you're not spiritual. Do you see how false teaching and that bondage can create dissension, judgment? Yeah. Yeah, you're not like us. And they're being criticizing, condemning. But Paul clearly says he had an infirmity, a physical infirmity. Verse 14, and my trial, which was in my flesh, where was the trial? In his what? Flesh. Now, if you're visiting Club Zion and your preacher preaches this, I am not criticizing your pastor. I'm criticizing his doctrine. Okay? His doctrine doesn't line up with scripture. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise nor nor reject. So that tells me, when he says you didn't despise it or reject it, that tells me that his infirmity was obvious. It was able to be seen. But you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So, 
this infirmity must have been so awful that it would be hard, hard, hard for people to look at him. But yet, the Holy Spirit in Paul moved their hearts. Moved their hearts. Physical infirmity. What then was the blessing for you enjoyed? What was the blessing that you enjoyed? Now, he's speaking past tense. Back when you loved me, what was it you enjoyed? Because it seems that now they're not loving him. He's defending his ministry. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you had have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. That's how much they loved him. Now, making the statement about his infirmity and how obvious his infirmity was and then talking about them wanting to pluck out their eyes if possible to give it to him, what do you think his infirmities might have been? Something with his eyes. He might have really bad, oozing disease in his eyes. There are some of his writings in Corinthians where, I think it's Corinthians where he says, I'm writing this with my own hands. I'm writing this letter with my own hands as if the other letters he had someone else write. So it's very possible. It's not my own conclusion. Many, many, many theologians believe that it could have been an eye problem. Now, his other infirmity, uh, they say, could have been a hip problem, a thorn in his, in his side, a hip problem. They also say that Paul was, he was always eating at people's houses. They say that Paul was probably a short person. So when I think of the writings of Paul, he's this short, fat guy that limps, and he's got his eyes hanging out, drooling sap out of his eyes. And what do they do? They love him. They love him. And he's saying, remember how you loved me. Verse 16 says, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So he is stating that they don't like him anymore. And why don't they like him anymore? They were willing to sacrifice anything for Paul. But now it seems that if they're his enemy. Why? I'll tell you why. Because the Judaizers have stolen the love and affection of the Galatian people. Who stole the love and affection of the Galatian people for Paul? The Judaizers. The legalists, the religious people. Now, there is religion that's good. The Bible tells us in James, it's, it's good. You know, what is religion? What is the pure, perfect religion? Those who take care of the orphans and the widows. What, what does that mean? Those who have compassion, those who have love and empathy, those who have a burden. That's the religious people, real religious people. But Paul's having a problem with the, the Judaizers, the legalists, who ran him out of town. I want to take you to Acts chapter 13. And in chapter 13, I'm not going to re re uh, read the whole chapter 13. You can do that on your own. But Paul comes to... Uh, you know, he comes to this, a place really where he, well, let me show you. You got a map up there? I'll show you on this map. He comes to Galatia, right here. And, and here is Galatia. And 
as he gets up into this area here, he comes to this town. Um, what's it called? Uh, my brain's stopping. Um, let's see if I can recall it. Come on, you pastors, give me a hand. Um, Iconium. So he comes there, and he, he goes to the synagogue, and he's preaching to them, Jesus. And, um, and when, he, when he comes there, the Gentiles also come, and they're listening to his teaching. And, and it kind of stirs up the, the Judaizers because they start to realize that Paul is getting a lot of attention here, and people are listening to him. And it says that they got jealous of Paul. They, uh, they, were, they, were, they were shook up about Paul getting all this attention. And so they get all upset, and they don't want to listen to him. But the Gentiles came to him and said, no, we want to hear more. Could you come tomorrow and, and teach us more? So he comes the following Sabbath, and he teaches the Gentiles more, and they're fired up. They're excited. They're like, wow, we can get in on this? I mean, we can get saved? I mean, we can have the Holy Spirit? I mean, God wants us to? God, this is so exciting. They were so fired up. And because they were fired up and so excited, the Judaizers flipped out. They, they just flipped out. So I'm going to pick it up towards the, the end of chapter 13, and it's a really good story. I encourage you to go ahead and read chapter 13 on your own. Don't read it now, because then you'll miss the rest of the message. Um, besides, you're not supposed to have your cell phone. Okay, verse 48. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified what? The word. <laughs> Isn't that something? The Gentiles. Now, we're up in Galatia. We're way up there uh, and basically, they have not heard the gospel up there yet. And there it is. And so here is Paul traveling through Iconium, and he stops there, and he preaches the gospel, which they have not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ yet. And so they're fired up. And it says, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified, what? The word of the Lord. And as many as heard... Her, as many had been appointed to eternal life, believed. So we have salvation going on. People are getting saved. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. What's, oh, it's gone. Um, what's the region? This is Galatia, okay? Now, to the church of, churches of Galatia, it wasn't just one little church here the gospel was spreading through this whole entire area as we know now as Turkey. And it was spreading out. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from what? From the town? From the city? No. Oh, it's gone. Uh, from the region. Wow. But, I love that. So the Gentiles are, are receiving the word of the Lord. They're excited about the word of the Lord. They're like blown away that they can get saved, blown away that they can be a part of this. But, there's that word but, but the Jews stirred up the devout prominent women and the chief men of the city. Raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. But they, but they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with the, with the joy and with the Holy Spirit. And so here's the picture. Thanks, guys. You're sharp now. There's that picture of what is taking place and what Paul is dealing with. Now, Paul begins to explain to them what the Judaizers' problem is. He gets to verse 17, and he says this. They zealously court you. What does it mean to court someone? Keep, keep them, make, you know, taking them out on dates. 
you know, keep courting them. Keep pretending on them. Jealously court you. Now, jealously court you. It's not that the, the, the Judaizers aren't jealous uh, in, in the way that we think of jealous for somebody that you love. They're jealous because the, the Galatians are loving Jesus and following Paul. And they're jealous. And he says, they jealously court you for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you. Why? That they may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always. And not only when I am present with you, my little children. They are to be zealous for a good thing. Always. See, when, when Paul was with them, they were so excited about the gospel. They were so happy. Just think of being a Gentile. And of that day, the Jews of that day pretty much made it clear that they were the chosen ones. And you're not. And Paul comes along and says, you're the chosen ones too. Uh, you get in on this too. You get to have your sins forgiven. You get to go to heaven. You get to have God there for you. And how exciting would it be for a Gentile to hear this news? They were just excited. They were fired up. Paul witnesses this, this excitement, this joy, he also witnesses their love for him and how they would even pluck out their own eyes if they could to help him. Now you see his burden, his pain. You know, the only thing I can relate this to is some of you parents might know this. You raise your kid to love Jesus. From the very early age of their diapers, you raise that kid to love Jesus. And you take that kid to church. You take that kid to Sunday school. You bring that kid to Awana. You raise that kid. You bring that kid to all the, the church events and all the Christmas parties and everything. And the kid goes to college. And the college professors all day long, five to six days a week, year after year, rob the love, the joy, and the affection for Christ right out of their hearts. And as a parent, how do you feel? How does that make you feel as a parent? Well, there's Paul. There's Paul. That's his burden. That's his pain. And you parents that have experienced that, you know that pain. You know that pain. You never want to lose your kid to a false teaching. And when you send your kid off to college, and it's not a Christian college, they're going to get false teaching. That's a guarantee. A guarantee that they will get false teaching. Why do you think the colleges have convinced us that our kids need to go to college? Because they are zealous for their souls. Zealous. I, um, I grieve for the kids that I've watched over the years leave the church, active in the youth group, pretty much one of the superstars in the youth group, and then years later see them completely denying Christ, their Savior. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. Are we really giving them an education? Are we really? Or are we giving them an indoctrination? But it is, verse 18, but it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am, am present with you, my little children, for whom I labor in birth pains. 
until Christ is formed in you. Little children, for whom I labor in birth pains. I have never given birth to a baby. Even though there are people on this planet that think men can, I have never given birth to a baby. And I couldn't imagine. But um, you ladies can, can not only imagine it, but you can also say, yeah, that hurts. Yeah, that hurts. Give me the shot. I'll take the shot. Why? It hurts. And he's saying, that's how painful it is for me to see you leave the true doctrine, to leave the true teachings, to leave the grace of Jesus Christ and go running to the law. It breaks my heart. I'm, I'm aching for you. I would like to be, verse 20 says, I, I would like to be present with you now and to, char charge my, and to change my tone for I have doubts about you. He'd like to change his tone. What is his tone? He's calling them out. He says, I, I'd like to be there face to face so you can see my pain, so you can see my tears, so you can feel what I'm feeling for you. I don't want, it's hard for you just to read my letter without seeing my face and seeing my pain. I love you. I burden for you. It pains me to see you walk away. And like I said, you parents that have children that have walked away, you know that pain. I tell you. I'd rather be in front of your face. Verse 21, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the bondservant, the other by the free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, but he who is of the, uh, he of the free woman through promise. Which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants the one from Mount Sinai which gives birth to bondage which is Hagar for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. The bondwoman, Hagar. Now, who is Hagar? Abraham, God came to Abraham and God said to Abraham that you're going to have a child. And I'm going to place this child through this lineage of yours is going to come forth my seed, the promise, the Christ, the salvation of the world. Through you, I'm going to send forth this Savior. He tells Abraham, he gives Abraham the promise, and your descendants will be more than the stars of the sky, and he says it's going to be you and your wife, Sarah. So a year goes by, they have no baby. And so his wife says, they, honey, maybe, maybe we could help God out. Why don't you take your maid, my maidservant and have relations with her, and then we can have a baby through her, and then we'll have that baby. So they do that. So Abraham has relations with Hagar, and she gives birth to Ishmael. Well, Hagar is... Uh, pretty much showing off that she can have a baby and Sarai can't have a baby. And here she is in her 90s and she can't have a baby. But then the Lord says, no, you're going to have a child. 
So she gives birth to a child. His name is Isaac. And so Abraham and Sarah have a child, Isaac, who is of the free woman. Who is the free woman? Sarah. She's free. Why? Because she's not a bond woman. She's not a bond slave. She's not a servant. She is the wife of a free man. So she's a free woman. And she gives birth to, to uh, Isaac. But then Hagar, or Hagar, however you want to say it, she gives birth to Ishmael. And then God says to Haggai, get out of here. And then Abraham makes the second mistake. The first mistake, he listens to his wife and, and um, they try to come up with a plan to help God. Something you need to really think about before you do something wrong. Don't ever try to help God. Remember to let God help you. He doesn't need help. All right, whatever plan you have, be patient. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. <sighs> Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. So this is the second mistake Abraham makes. He says to God, here is Haggai, Sarah's servant, maidservant, with a child from her husband, and Abraham, that's Abraham's son. And Abraham says to the Lord, oh, but if only Ishmael could live. And so God says to him, all right, I'll make him a great nation. Why was that Abraham's big mistake? Do you know who the Ishmael nation is today? Islam. I'd say uh, Abraham should have just let it go. <laughs> let it go. And so, Abraham, so God said to Abraham, all right, I'll make him a mighty nation. Yeah, he did. He made him a mighty nation. And do you know that Ishmael and Isaac have been at war since the get-go? Since the get-go. Since the beginning, they've been at war. Are they at war today? Yes. Thank you, Abraham. You're a genius. Verse 27, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. So, he starts out that section of talking about uh, Ishmael and Isaac. He starts out by saying the bondwoman is representative, uh, was, is a represent or an example of Mount Sinai. What do we know about Mount Sinai? That's where God gave the Ten Commandments. What is the Ten Commandments? It's the law. Okay? So the, 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 the true Jerusalem is what? Abraham. What is Abraham? Abraham is the promise, the covenant promise. Remember, the scriptures say that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. What does that mean? That Abraham got saved by believing God. Faith. What was the belief? What was the promise that Abraham believed in? That Abraham would send the Christ, the seed, Jesus. So, how did Abraham get saved? He believed in Jesus. So how is it that 1,500 years go by and the Jews have gotten so far off the mark of the promise? How is it possible that they've abandoned salvation by faith and cling to salvation by works? And that's what Paul is asking them. How is it that you got here? What were you thinking? Verse 31. Did I? No, I didn't do 30. True? 
That's true, Pastor Keith. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. The son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Okay? So then, verse 31, brethren, we are not chosen of the bondwoman, but of the free. Wow. There you have the conclusion of chapter 4. I think that the teaching tonight helped a lot of people understand um, how this whole faith, grace, and salvation thing works. It's not by works, lest anyone boast. It is a gift of God, and it comes through faith. And how do you get faith? Come, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How did the Galatians get their faith? Paul brought the word of God to them. He preached the word of God. And as a result, they got saved. But in the meantime, when Paul went away, there comes the robbers. So when you hear truth and t truth is taught to you, don't leave here and let the robbers steal the gift that God has given you. The gift that God has given you. You can't be good enough. You know why? The standard for good is Christ himself. You'll never be as good as Christ. That's the standard. The only way that you can please God is to be clothed in Christ's righteousness. That when, when, when God looks at you, he sees his son. There's the pleasure that God takes. So, if you're not saved, get saved. Seriously. If you're not saved, get saved. Because if you're not saved, you're not pleasing God. I don't care how many stray cats you take home. I don't know how much, I don't care how much garbage you pick off the beach. I don't care how many trees you hug. You'll never, ever please God till you are a born-again believer. Because he has to see Jesus in you. Because when he can't see Jesus, all he sees is the filthy mess. That's all he sees. You can call me out on it, or you can make an appointment and come see me at my office, and I'll take you through the scriptures and prove it to you. Or you could just read Romans chapter 5, 6, and 7, and 8, and you can get your own teaching from the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word. I pray that your word comes alive every single time we look at it because it's living, it's active, and it changes lives. It convicts, it convinces, and it brings us to a place where we must make a decision. I thank you, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for every soul in this building tonight that you bring us closer to you and that you get us home safely. And thank you for these, these facilities and all the gifts you've given us to have a service tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.